remember the casket was small and her eyes were closed. I think one of her eyes was a little bit like droopy or something. I thought that was weird. How did you feel seeing her? A lot of sadness. I don't think I really fully grasped. Like after this, I won't see her again. I know who killed Champonet. There's no doubt in my mind who killed Champonet. And until, while this investigation is still ongoing, I don't think it's appropriate that I, I say that name out loud. I'm appalled that anyone would think that John or I would be involved in such a hideous, heinous crime, but let me assure you that I did not kill Jean Benet. I did not have anything to do with it. I love that child with my whole of my heart and soul. Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. And today, I'm going to be discussing the unsolved murder of Jean Benet Ramsey. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the case, I'm going to be showing a brief overview here, and I'm also going to be leaving some links in the description that cover the case in its entirety. However, today, I really want to focus on just a few aspects of the case that I found pretty intriguing. So, with that being said, sit back, relax, grab yourself a cup of coffee. And let's get into this. The first clue Jean Benet Ramsey may be in danger? This ransom note Patsy Ramsey says she found on the back staircase of their Boulder, Colorado home. It is the day after Christmas, 1996. The chilling note is addressed to John Ramsey from someone claiming to represent a small foreign faction. The note demands $118,000 and threatens the immediate execution of their daughter. And I immediately ran back upstairs and pushed open her door, and she was not in her bed. And I screamed for John. The couple waits hours, but the call to arrange the ransom exchange never comes. A Boulder police detective tells John Ramsey to search the house, including the basement. It was a four uh, concrete wall room. Um, uh, I knew instantly when I opened the door that I'd found her. You know she was uh, dead? No, I didn't. I, I had this rush of just, thank God I found her. Um, uh, she, her hands were tied. She had tape over her mouth. Uh, I removed the tape immediately. The six-year-old beauty queen has a cord wrapped around her throat, held by a paintbrush from Patsy Ramsey's hobby kit. An autopsy later shows that her skull is fractured, and evidence of a sexual assault is inconclusive. Days later, the Ramseys issue this warning. I will tell my friends to keep, keep your babies close to you. There's someone out there. But who? There are no signs of forced entry at the family's home, leading detectives to wonder about John and Patsy Ramsey, even about their nine-year-old son, Burke. All of them give hair and blood samples to police. But a year later, December 1997, they are still not cleared. They do remain under an umbrella of suspicion, but uh, we're not ready to name any suspects. We are now learning that two years later, a grand jury indicts John and Patsy Ramsey for child abuse resulting in death, an accessory to the murder. But then District Attorney Alex Hunter chooses not to charge the couple. We do not have sufficient evidence to warrant the filing of charges against anyone who has been investigated at this time. DNA evidence from the scene is entered into the FBI database in December 2003. Then, three years later, an arrest. 41-year-old John Mark Carr, an elementary school teacher with three sons, is arrested in Bangkok, Thailand, after claiming he was present when Jean Benet died. 
He says he loved her and her death was an accident. Carr isn't charged after DNA tests confirm he isn't a match. Two years later, in 2008, new DNA analysis clears the Ramsey family for good. The Boulder County District Attorney formally apologizes in a letter to John Ramsey for the cloud of suspicion his family's lived under for 12 years. The apology comes too late for Patsy Ramsey, who died of ovarian cancer in 2006. She is buried in a cemetery near Atlanta, next to her daughter. Randy Kay, CNN, New York. So there's a lot to unpack here, but I think possibly the best place to start is with the foreign DNA that was found on Jean Bonnet. Now, remember, law enforcement actually ruled out John Mark Carr as a suspect, and they went so far as to publicly clear the Ramsey family as a direct result of the DNA evidence. But as you're about to see, this was most likely a rather massive mistake on the part of the district attorney. It's been nearly 20 years since John Bonet Ramsey was found dead in the basement of her family's home in Boulder. It was Christmas Day, 1996. We know what you may be thinking. You've heard it all. What more could there possibly be to learn about this child's death? You will not see what we're telling you tonight in the recent specials on TV or books in the true crime section of the bookstore. Nine Month Stone investigator Kevin Vaughn, along with the Boulder Daily Camera, have this exclusive and in-depth report that shows the DNA investigators have been relying on may not be the killer's DNA after all. It's a murder with two competing theories. John Benet Ramsey was either killed on Christmas night 1996 by someone in her family, or she was killed by an intruder. For more than a decade, those theories played out in the tabloids, on talk radio, even inside the investigation. Then on July 9, 2008, attorney says new DNA evidence in the murder of Jean Benet Ramsey. Boulder District Attorney Mary Lacey fully embraced the intruder theory. Clears her family of any involvement in her death. That just baffled my mind. Shocking fellow prosecutors. I wouldn't have done it because I don't think that's the role of the district attorney. Her successor. I was stunned. I, I was also appalled. And even the Colorado governor who assembled a task force to look into the case. I couldn't see any reason based on what she said for her to do so. Had never seen anything like that in the past from any other prosecutor and just couldn't believe she chose to do that. Lacey's decision was based on DNA she said was conclusive. DNA she said John Bonet's killer left behind on her panties and long johns. DNA that would crack the case if it could just be identified or matched. But the actual DNA test results Mary Lacey used to clear the Ramseys, obtained exclusively by Nine News and the Boulder Daily Camera, tell a very different story. So I was always surprised at what she did and now I'm deeply concerned. It's the latest controversy in a case full of problems. A bungled crime scene, infighting among investigators and prosecutors. First of all, many of you know that last week... A decision by former District Attorney Alex Hunter to drop charges authorized by a grand jury against John and Patsy Ramsey. Mary Lacey succeeded Hunter in 2001 with a reputation as a strong supporter of the intruder theory. When she issued her exoneration letter and apologized to the Ramseys, she created the impression that if someone could just identify the person whose DNA profile had been found, the case would be solved. We now have pretty irrefutable DNA evidence according to the DA's office. And that's the most significant thing to me. And certainly we are grateful that they acknowledged that we, you know, based on that, certainly could not have been involved. So we had D8, D21. Nine wants to know, and the daily camera took those same lab results to forensic experts. Yeah. The first time that data had ever been independently evaluated. And those experts agreed. The DNA results don't come close to proving that an intruder killed John Bonet. It's certainly possible that an intruder was responsible for the murder, but I don't think that the DNA evidence proves it. The only way I can describe this evidence is uninformative. It really is, it's not dispositive of the presence of a perpetrator. There is foreign DNA, but that foreign DNA can easily be accounted for by a number of innocent mechanisms. 
Male DNA was originally identified in John Bonet's underwear during testing in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Lacey ordered new tests in 2007 and 2008 on John Bonet's long johns and nightgown. It's those tests that led Lacey to exonerate the Ramseys. I can tell you in my experience. A decision that confounded Troy Ide, a former U.S. attorney who was on the Ramsey Task Force appointed by Governor Owens. There's a real danger whenever you say, okay, we've looked at this and we've categorically determined something. The experts who reviewed the DNA test data for Nine News and the Daily Camera questioned Lacey's exoneration on multiple fronts. First, the DNA profile Lacey said belonged to the killer may not be the profile of a single person. There is a reasonable uh, chance that what has been um, attributed to a single individual actually represents DNA from multiple individuals that has been, that has been sort of um, uh, hobbled together into a single profile. Well, it's a rather obvious point, but I mean, if you're looking for somebody who doesn't exist because it's actually several people, it's, it's a problem. And as for the DNA on the Long Johns, heralded by Lacey as conclusive, our experts believe those two spots are mixtures of genetic material from more than two people. Uh, it looks and appears to me to be at least three individuals. And so that there's a mixture here that's not just a single profile. Which is precisely what Mary Lacey knew before she exonerated the Ramseys. This report, obtained by Nine News and the Daily Camera, went to Lacey's office three months before she cleared the family. Of the two spots on John Bonet's Long Johns, the report says it's likely more than two people contributed to the mixtures. And after eliminating John Bonet's DNA, the remaining DNA contribution should not be considered a single source profile. She knew, based on your investigation, that this DNA wasn't necessarily from one person and that it in fact was potentially accumulated DNA. She knew it at the time and why she used this evidence to clear the Ramsey family then, a clearance that has continued because it's on the public record through today is, is something I, I can't explain and she should explain. Mary Lacey has never talked about her decision to exonerate the Ramseys, and she's not talking now. We tried calling, emailing, sending her a letter, even visiting her home. So far, she has not responded. One person who is talking is Lynn Wood, John Ramsey's attorney. He tells us he has absolute and total confidence in Mary Lacey's integrity, and he firmly believes this is a case that will be solved using DNA. We have a longer statement from Lynn Wood available at 9news.com. So the DNA that the district attorney relied on is most likely a mixture of multiple profiles that was kind of hodgepodge together to make a completely new and inaccurate profile of a person that doesn't even exist. Then the district attorney used this fake profile to exonerate the Ramsey family and confirm her long-held suspicion that there was an intruder involved. And if that's not confirmation bias, I don't know what is. American songwriter Paul Simons once said, a man sees what he wants to see, and disregards the rest. But that doesn't apply to you, right? Well, maybe that's just because you don't want it to. Like it or not, we as human beings tend to think that our initial opinions are correct, and when presented with the facts, we pick out the ones that suit our presumptions best. This is called confirmation bias, or the tendency to favor information that confirms one's own assumptions or preconceptions whether they're true or not. But let's play devil's advocate. What if an intruder was involved? That would mean that someone entered the Ramsey's home, abducted John Bonet, and took her to the basement, where they killed her. Then they made the decision to go back upstairs after the murder, while everyone's asleep, so they could write this elaborate ransom letter. Then, at some point they didn't like what they were writing, so they threw it in the garbage and wrote an entirely new, lengthy, elaborate ransom letter. One that seems straight out of a movie, and in case you think I'm exaggerating, this is the note in its entirety. You be the judge. Mr. Ramsey, listen carefully. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We do respect your business, but not the country that it serves. At this time, we have your daughter in our possession. She is safe and unharmed, and if you want her to see 1997, you must follow our instructions to the letter. 
you will withdraw $118,000 from your account. $100,000 will be in $100 bills and the remaining $18,000 in $20 bills. Make sure you bring an adequate size attaché to the bank. When you get home, you will put the money in a brown paper bag. I will call you between 8 and 10 a.m. tomorrow to instruct you on delivery. The delivery will be exhausting, so I advise you to be rested. If we monitor you getting the money early, we might call you early to arrange an earlier delivery of the money and hence an earlier delivery pickup of your daughter. Any deviation of my instructions will result in the immediate execution of your daughter. You will also be denied her remains for proper burial. The two gentlemen watching over your daughter do not particularly like you, so I advise you to not provoke them. Speaking to anyone about your situation, such as police, FBI, etc., will result in your daughter being beheaded. If we catch you talking to a stray dog, she dies. If you alert bank authorities, she dies. If the money is in any way marked or tampered with, she dies. You will be scanned for electronic devices and if any are found, she dies. You can try to deceive us, but be warned that we are familiar with law enforcement countermeasures and tactics. You stand a 99% chance of killing your daughter if you try to outsmart us. Follow our instructions and you stand a 100% chance of getting her back. You and your family are under constant scrutiny as well as the authorities. Don't try to grow a brain, John. You're not the only fat cat around, so don't think that killing will be difficult. Don't underestimate us, John. Use that good southern common sense of yours. It is up to you now, John. Victory. S. B. T. C. And they showed the police this ransom note, which is one of the most bizarre ransom notes anybody has ever seen. There were a number of things unusual about the note. Number one, the length of the note was very long, three pages. I've seen and worked a number of kidnappings for the FBI, and most of the notes are very short, they're very terse, very succinct, and they give very specific instructions, almost like bullet points. So my first impression was uh, that uh, this, guy, this guy wrote the Magna Carta. I have never seen a ransom kidnapping that asks for such a specific amount of money. The ransom note was objectively bizarre. For starters, it was written in the house, most likely after the murder. Asking for money for a kidnapped child seems somewhat counterproductive when you leave their murdered body in the basement of the same home you leave the ransom note in. I know it seems obvious, but I really can't stress this enough. They left an elaborate three-page ransom note in the house with the body. It just makes zero sense. The amount asked for in the note just so happened to be the exact same amount that John Ramsey had recently made as a bonus at work. Now, maybe that was a coincidence, but that's one hell of a coincidence. It's almost as if the writer of the note wanted law enforcement to believe they were targeting John's work bonus, which is a bit of an issue for people who believe in the intruder theory. How could some random intruder have known what John's work bonus was? How many small foreign factions do you know that refer to themselves as small foreign factions? Handwriting analysis, which admittedly isn't a foolproof science, came back to seemingly match Patsy Ramsey's handwriting. John's exact work bonus that was not known to the public was the amount of money that the killer asked for, and let's not forget that they were demanding money for a girl who was actually dead inside of the exact same home that they left the note in. And if all of this wasn't weird enough, well, there's this. Okay, what's your name? Are you happy? I'm the mother. Oh my god! 
Okay, I'm sending an officer over, okay? Please. Do you know how long she's been gone? No, I don't. Please, we just got out. Is she right here? Oh, my God, please. Okay, please well, this is I am, honey. Please. Take a deep breath. Please, please. Okay. hurry, hurry, hurry. Patsy, 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 Patsy. Now, I'm not a big fan of enhancements, mostly because the results tend to become something more subjective than they were beforehand, but I think what's actually being said in the audio is not really the important part, but more how many people are heard speaking in the audio. Mostly because Burke Ramsey, John Bonet's brother, was supposedly in bed asleep according to his parents' statements at the time, and it does appear that you can hear Burke in the background of this phone call. Now, this in and of itself really wouldn't be that big of a deal if it wasn't for the type of behavior Burke had apparently displayed in the months leading up to the murder. Now, there are numerous articles online claiming that Burke had been aggressive toward Jean Benet before the murders and at times even went so far as hitting her. There are even articles online claiming that Burke had actually hit Jean Benet with a golf club in the weeks leading up to her death, although I wasn't able to independently verify this to be 100% true. It does get even weirder, though, when you consider the coroner report showed that Jean Benet had a piece of pineapple in her stomach contents when she was given her autopsy, and it was ruled that that was most likely the last thing she had eaten before she died, which is only relevant because pineapple and milk had apparently been the bedtime snack that Patsy had made for Burke, and Patsy went out of her way to insist that John Bonet didn't have pineapple that evening. Yet, there was Burke's late-night snack in her stomach contents, which obviously caused people to speculate that Burke may have hit John Bonet when she grabbed some of his food, and obviously the bullshit kidnapping was just to cover up what Burke had done as an accident. Are you aware of these different theories that are out there? Theories that you killed your sister, theories that your mother killed John Bonet, and theories that an intruder killed John Bonet. Those seem to be the three camps that people talk about. Yeah, I mean, if I know that we were suspects. I didn't know they were camps, I guess. And these are people that post online. The shorthand is RDI, Ramsey did it, IDI, the intruder did it, or BDI, Bert did it. Do you know the theories that they set forth in saying that your mom killed John Bonet? I don't know the details, but I know the ransom note, they think the handwriting match. Have you seen it? Have you read it? I don't think I've read the whole thing. I've definitely seen pictures of it, though. Did the handwriting look familiar to you at all? Had uh, you seen it ever before? No. I feel like the listen carefully is very distinct, and I've never really seen that. I don't know. I've never really looked at it closely, because I'll see it and kind of get taken aback. And it's not something I really want to look at <laughs> like a lot, you know? Right. Now, this is all total speculation. And I'm not going to deep dive the Burke Ramsey theory for that very reason. But the main difference with this is that it's not truly contradicted by any of the known evidence, which is more than you can say for the intruder theory. However, Burke acting bizarre in the Dr. Phil interview means nothing. Half of the people here on YouTube are bizarre, and at best it's subjective, and the truth should never be subjective. What wasn't subjective, however, was the DNA. 
The experts who reviewed the DNA test data for Nine News and the Daily Camera questioned Lacey's exoneration on multiple fronts. First, the DNA profile Lacey said belonged to the killer may not be the profile of a single person. There is a reasonable uh, chance that what has been um, attributed to a single individual actually represents DNA from multiple individuals that has been, that has been sort of um, uh, hobbled together into a single profile. Well, the sketchy DNA evidence used by the district attorney to clear the Ramsey family didn't seem to go over well with pretty much everyone who was involved in the case, which is kind of ironic when you consider statements made by detectives who investigated the case when it happened. Hey. Oh, hello. Nearly three years after the murder of John Benet Ramsey, the case remains unsolved. But the detective who first handled the case has no questions about who is guilty. I know who killed Jean Benet. There's no doubt in my mind who killed Jean Benet. And until, while this investigation is still ongoing, I don't think it's appropriate that I, I say that name out loud. Linda Arndt was the first detective on the scene at the Ramsey house on December 26, 1996, the morning John and Patsy Ramsey had reported their six-year-old daughter John Benet missing. Arndt was the only officer there for much of the day. She later would be roundly criticized, vilified in the press as responsible for a bungled investigation. Now she's speaking out to set the record straight, telling her side of that dramatic day three years ago. It all began with a call at 6.30 in the morning from her sergeant. He said there's been a kidnapping. It involves a six-year-old girl. There was a ransom note, a two-and-a-half-page ransom note. And according to the uh, ransom note, there was going to be a phone call from the author, and they were supposed to call between 8 and 10 a.m. So I was supposed to get to the house for purposes of monitoring the phone call. 8.10 a.m., Arndt arrived at the Ramsey home and meets John Ramsey for the first time. How did he strike you? Cordial. Cordial? Mm-hmm. Upset? Cordial. Distraught? Cordial. Did it strike you at all that he was that that was behavior that was unusual for somebody whose child was just kidnapped? It's been my experience that people respond to trauma in different ways. So if someone has a response that is different from mine, I don't put judgment to it, I'll just, I'll just note it. And that is what she says she did all morning, make mental notes of all things curious, including, she says, the fact that Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey remained apart in separate rooms for most of the day. That at one point, she says John Ramsey took time out in the middle of the crisis to read his mail. I remember seeing John in the kitchen, looking through his mail, and I, I made a note that he was looking at his mail, and then I wondered, where did your mail come from? Isn't it possible maybe he was opening the mail looking for a clue from the kidnapper? I don't know. And I, and I don't speculate. Um, it's a piece of information that I see. It's uh, something that I know. You thought it was unusual, however. I can say that it stuck out. 10 a.m., the deadline imposed by the writer of the ransom note for a telephone call. 10 o'clock comes and goes, and there's no acknowledgement within the house from anyone that the deadline imposed by the author of the ransom note has come and gone. Nobody said it's 10 o'clock and the kidnappers haven't called? Nobody said that. Was that something else you took note of? Absolutely. By 10.30 in the morning, Arndt was the only police officer in the house with John and Patsy Ramsey, their pastor, and four family friends. As they waited for news, the tension was mounting. Arndt called her station house for backup repeatedly, but none had arrived. How many times did you call the police department asking where your backup was and what was going on? Well, I remember at least two calls. Both times I was told everybody's in a meeting. Um, they got your message, and uh, that was it. Were you feeling pressure being in charge of a group this large and with anxiety that high? I felt tremendous pressure.
1.01 p.m. Although the house had already been searched by patrolmen before she arrived, Arndt says that in order to break the building tension, she asked John Ramsey and his friend Fleet White to search the house again, top to bottom, looking for anything out of place. She says she gave them specific instructions not to touch anything. She says John Ramsey headed straight to the basement. She heard Fleet White scream for an ambulance and then a chilling discovery. For Arndt, the pieces of the puzzle fell into place. And I see John Ramsey carrying Jean Bonnet up the last three steps from the basement. And, um, and my mind exploded. And everything that I had noted that morning that stuck out instantly made sense. And Jean was clearly dead. Then she's been dead for a while. I ordered him to put Jean down. I knelt next to her and I leaned down to her face. And John leaned down opposite me. And um, his face was just inches from mine. And we had a nonverbal exchange that I will never forget. The ransom note appears to have been staged, and there was absolutely no reason for it to have been written. There were specific details in the note that required intimate knowledge of the family, there were no footprints outside of the house in the snow, and the DNA used to exonerate the Ramsey family from any wrongdoing is, to put it mildly, strongly in question. And the saddest part about all of this is there will almost certainly never be an arrest in this case as a direct result of the district attorney using junk science to back up her pre-existing theory. If anything, this case serves as an excellent example of confirmation bias and just how wrong cases can go when investigators allow themselves to tunnel vision on a specific theory and discount any evidence that contradicts what they've already made up their mind about. It happens way too often, and unfortunately, I think that this case is just another example of that. If you enjoy true crime or videos about mysteries and unsettling things, you might enjoy one of these videos as well. And with that being said, thank you so much for watching.